speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester. Rochester Indian Media. Hey, this is Indie TV. I'm Dawn, the Barefoot Host, and today we're going to talk about knowing your rights. Know your rights, know your rights, know your rights. And to help us do that is Gary Puttup, director of the Genesee Valley Civil Liberties Union here in New York. And thank you, Gary, for being here today. Uh, I think in this time of a lot of intimidation, a lot of changes about where are our rights, a lot of things have been moved back, taken away. Uh, we just want to get back to the basics. I think that's where we're going to start today. Um, you know, I'm just going to start with um, requests, requests from police when you're out on the streets, things that you have to answer or don't have to answer if you're profiled. Sadly, that's always been a case. People get stopped. I have a friend who often, as he's walking to work, uh, because he's black in society, gets questioned a lot more than other people. Where are you going? Can I see your ID? What are people's rights out on the streets? Okay. And thanks. Oh, oh, you're <laughs> welcome, and, and, and thank you for having us. This is one of the things that we like to to, to talk about and uh, actually uh, I as the uh, director here in Rochester go out uh, very often conduct Know Your Right workshops. Um, actually if I could uh, plug real quick there will be one at the uh, Anti-War Crisis Center sure. coming up and I believe um, it's scheduled July 8th and uh, but we really like people to know what their rights are because they there's a lot on television there's a lot of urban myths there's there's a lot of confusion about that. In, in New York the, what uh, governs uh, the conduct of the police is what's called the criminal procedure law. And one of the things I can encourage people to do is, if you're good with a computer, you could use a search engine and just, just uh, um, check under New York state laws or the criminal procedure law, and you can look some of these things up and double check on them, and, and it's, it's actually fairly concise and well written. So in New York, uh, what happens is if you're stopped by a police officer, you have to answer certain questions, but those are limited to your name, your address, and an explanation of your conduct. Um, you don't have to provide a social security number or a date of birth or any other information. And to take a step back, before the police officer actually makes the stop and makes those uh, requests, he has to have a suspicion, and a, a, a specific and articulable suspicion that you have are engaged or are about to engage in a crime. It's really not enough for a police officer to stop somebody just because they're riding a bicycle or just because they're on the street corner and, and begin a conversation. Is that the same as probable cause? And isn't that very subjective? Well, well, right? probable, that's reasonable suspicion. Mm -hmm. And that's really a, a, the lowest level, that, that, that there's a set of facts that the officer can, can go to a court and say, these are the facts as I saw them, and I made a reasonable uh, um, conclusion that this person, again, may have been doing one of these things. And then I approached him and I, I began an interview with this person. And without getting too complicated, in New York there's actually four different levels of um, police intervention with citi citizens. And they're called the DeBoer standards. And, um, you know, a police officer, as he walks down the street, if we have somebody on foot patrol, there's nothing stopping him from just walking up and say, hi, how are you, you know, uh, um, you know, how's your day going, and this and that. And it's just, it's just casual conversation. But the higher those levels go, for instance, like if he wants to say, but what's your name? You know, mm -hmm. where do you live, and why are you here? He has to have gotten to that level of reasonable suspicion. Mm -hmm. Probable cause is what he needs to make an arrest. And just briefly, what probable cause is, is, is the officer needs to have a set of facts that says that there was a crime that was committed, and this person probably did it. Mm -hmm. It's not that he knows that you did it, but just probably did it. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what he uses to make an arrest. And do uh, law enforcement have to identify themselves to us? I mean, if we said, well, what's your name and what's your badge number, is that something that they have to be willing to provide if asked? Oh, yes. Before an officer can make an arrest or make a stop, he has to be able to state his authority. So, um, I th you know, sometimes people wonder, well, if I'm in the city of Rochester and I'm stopped by a trooper, do I have to answer these questions? The answer is yes. A police officer works within what's called their geographical area of employment, and that, that's where they have authority. So anywhere in the city of Rochester, a city police officer can act in that, in that capacity. Anywhere in Monroe County, a sheriff's deputy can. Anywhere in New York State, a trooper can. And under some circumstances, a city officer can even act as a police officer outside his jurisdiction. And, th and those, there are certain felonies, but those, those, are, those are serious crimes. So when we have things like this Operation Impact, where we have troopers and deputies and, and city uh, police officers in the city, they're all able to uh, do this. Now, if an officer or, say, a federal agent who is in plain clothes um, approaches someone, they actually have to state who they are. So you, you might see this, for instance, in the city, if there was a, an undercover officer or a plainclothes officer and he walks up to someone, he has to say, yes, I'm a police officer. You know, usually they'll say, you know, I'm a, I'm a city police officer or I'm a deputy or I'm a state trooper, I'm an FBI agent. Not if they're going for entrapment, they don't have to, right? Because well, entrapment's <laughs> against the law, so I'm sure they wouldn't be doing that because we always play by the rules. Okay. Yes. Well, so you know a lot about this. I mean, authority. obviously, uh, as your position here at the um, local chapter of the ACLU, but also you were in law enforcement. How did you make the shift? We talked yes. a little bit about I, that. I spent 30 years as a law enforcement officer, um, and to me, it was it was it was just totally consistent. Um, I, I I love this country. I think this is that we have a, an excellent constitution. I think that the rules that we have here. Are very are very good, and, and as we look around and we, we look what goes on in some other places, that that we sh that we should protect this and, and preserve uh, what we have here. As as a law enforcement officer, whenever I took an oath, you know it always started that that, that, that I would sw uh, that I swore to protect and uphold the Constitution, defend the Constitution. That was always my first priority, and as as uh, uh, a member of the, uh, the New York Civil Liberties Union, that remains a priority for me. And we're going to get back to this. We're going to talk more about um, the Civil Liberties Union cases you're working on, positions you hold about things happening here, uh, the curfew laws, zero tolerance, and um, something else we want to describe to people called Cop Watch. And we're going to talk all about that when we come back after some break. And you're watching Rochester Indie Media's Indie TV. Check us out online, indymedia.org, I-N-D-Y media.org, Indie Media. Org. See you after this break. Oh, hi. I'm Steve Heiss. I'm the producer and editor of the Indie Media Newsreel, which is the program you're watching right now. Or, well, I mean... Very, very important message. So listen very carefully. Not now, now. Because now, now, I'm recording this, and then I have to edit it, and... But, but I mean, for your now, right now, as you're watching this, it's now. Um, well, anyway. Um, Newsreel is a monthly program that's been in production for about seven years. Every month, activist video producers from around the country, around the world even, send in video segments about events in their communities. Events where people are standing up for what they believe in, and trying to make a difference in the world. However, we have a problem. Lately, for whatever reason, when I sit down toward the end of the month to work on putting together the next month's program, I look at the pile of submissions sent to me, and, well, that pile's been pretty empty. For some reason, people just aren't sending very much in. And I'm not sure why, but I need contributions to make the show happen. I can't just make it out of thin air. I need other people's documentaries, little documentaries, two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, about things going on around them in their communities. So if you're watching this and you like this program, maybe you can help. Maybe you make videos or know someone who does. Someone who's involved with a local struggle and wants to document that struggle. Or maybe someone who's already making 
short little documentaries and wants more opportunities to get the word out about what they're doing. There's more details about this project at newsreel.indymedia.org. Help spread the word. Thanks for your help and thanks for watching. Bye. We're back, uh, Rochester Indy TV. We're talking to Gary Putup today, the director of the Genesee Valley Civil Liberties Union, and we were just in the middle of trying to figure out all these details: when you get stopped, how to behave, um, you know, what you have to, uh, you know, tell a police officer, what you don't have to say, because there's a lot of intimidation. I mean, you could be intimidated to say more than you need to, and it could be used against you. So you want to be careful. And how do you? counsel people in the best way of, you know, remaining silent and knowing where that, that line is? Um, well, what I would tell people is this, is you want to, you, you have to cooperate and ne never to resist. Because even if you think you've been wronged, or if you think the officer's acting inappropriately, or he doesn't have cause to stop you or to make an arrest, it's, all, it's a mistake to resist arrest. It's a mistake to, to talk to the, to touch the officer or to argue with the officer. Um, because then you can end up in a situation where you end up getting arrested for another charge, which, which would be valid. And um, it's, it's going to make uh, your situation worse, and there's always the danger that someone's going to get hurt. So the first thing we tell people is, you know, just comply with the officer's request. Now that said, um, again, in, unless the officer has um, some reason to make an arrest, it's, it's your name, it's your address, and what your business is. Beyond that, what we could tell people is if the officer starts to ask more questions, always remember anything you say can be used against you. Even if, you know, Miranda hasn't been read to you. And, and, and there's a lot of confusion about Miranda. Miranda only applies once the person is actually under arrest or is not free to leave. So if an officer walks up and starts to ask questions, you know, don't make excuses, don't offer too much information because all of those things can still be used. Because what the officer can claim in court is the person <laughs> wasn't under arrest, so this was a voluntary statement. And w so what we tell people is, is to ask the officer, am I under arrest? Am I free to leave? If you're free to leave and you're uncomfortable, you can say to the officer, if I'm free to leave, then I choose to leave and I really don't want to answer any more questions. What and if you're not arrested and detained? What? Well. Um, at that point, he's either going he's going to have to he or she is going to have to decide if they have enough to hold you, if they have probable cause that we talked about, or they have enough suspicion to actually detain you. Now, d detaining somebody is really a temporary seizure of that person. It's not quite an arrest, but then they have enough to hold you. But you still don't have to say anything. Is there a time limit you can be detained? Is there a certain well, maximum? Well, that really depends on the case. But it's supposed to be a brief, and it's just a small or mm -hmm. petty intrusion upon the person's liberty. And so where where do people go if they feel violated or some injustice had happened? Well, say, to them? say somebody is uh, yeah, a, a situation occurs, and they feel that their rights have, that have been violated. First things we tell them to do is is you, you contact an attorney, um, and whether it, uh, if if they can afford it, you can call the Monroe County Bar Association. There's a number there for a referral service. If, if someone's in a position where they can't have an attorney after they've been arrested and they qualify, there's the public defender's office, which in Monroe County is, is, is a very good, very competent attorney. It's a little overwhelmed right now, but, but they're very good. Or you can call us and you can go to our website, mm -hmm. www.nyclu.org, and there's a link to uh, the Genesee Valley. The, our phone number is there. Mm -hmm. You can call and we can talk. But I would say this, don't, you know, really, don't engage in conversations with the police. Don't offer excuses. Don't, um, you know, make up alibis. Because one of the things that, that, that sometimes people forget is if anything you say is going to be used against you. Mm -hmm. Even if the officer reads you your Miranda, you choose to have an attorney, and you continue to talk, sometimes those statements can be used for what's called impeachment purposes. So you really don't want to say anything once the officer gets beyond um, you know, th again, the name, you know, the, 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 the address and, and, and your... And something we've been interested in as media activists and, you know, um, the media democracy movement is 
taking responsibility of ourselves as citizens. And there's an organization called Cop Watch, and it's a it's in the United States and it's in Canada, and it's a network of activists who take it upon themselves to observe and document conduct of the police. And so maybe with cameras or pen and paper, what would people need to know who want to engage in this if they feel that there's been ongoing violations? In my neighborhood, I saw a jump out with masked, you know, uh, police agents or law enforcement agents, and we film even though you can't see their face, we didn't know what was really going on, but it seems there's uh, excessive aggression too in the area that I live, and I like to keep an eye on this and be aware. And how would that, how would you suggest people do that um, well, kind of have, work? Well, citizens have a right to film. Uh, these people, you know, uh, uh, the police are public servants, and they're engaged in conduct in a public, fo in a public place. You know, if you want to, if you want to film that, you can. There's been a lot of questions about this, especially since 911. Uh, we, we actually, I helped a person here in Rochester uh, a few months ago that was uh, taking pictures. It was a photography student from RIT and was approached by some officers and said, we well, can't take pictures of this. There was a Monroe County office building. You can't take pictures of the building. Well, that's just bogus. I mean, there, there, it's a public building. You're in a public place. There's no reason why this person can't take pictures. No law against taking pictures. And in, in, in the, the thing we're talking about here, Don, is these are people, again, they're, they're performing these official acts in a capacity. If you're in public and you're taking pictures of this, that's fine. That's not against the law. In fact, one of the things we do to, I've encouraged people at some of our workshops, when people um, are, uh, talk about protest, um, for wh whatever that issue might be for them, is one of the things that I've encouraged them to do is have somebody there with a video camera that's willing to take pictures and not, that's not, that may not be involved in the action. So that if they think that something's going on, that they, they question, that they have that video evidence. And uh, one of the things to keep in <laughs> mind is if somebody's videotaping this, and again, say you're on the sidewalk and you see something, you're videotaping this, and an officer says, hey, listen, I want that camera. The answer is no. I have a right to do this. It's not your camera. You can either get a subpoena, all right, because if an officer were to make the claim, he says, well, we, there might be evidence on that, and we need that evidence for something else that happened, officer, get a subpoena. We're going to talk about that. Hopefully, we won't have to get a subpoena, but we will be back. Indy TV, Rochester Indy Media. Stay tuned. Uh, I ordered the soup. This is the soup, miss. This is a bowl of rocks. All of our items are made from rocks, delicious government rocks. lights on in here? If you need light to access this building, you can have your doctor certify your disability, then ask for special accommodation. Equal access is a right, not a privilege. I'm John Schorsch. I'm Sarah Green. I'm Deborah Peterson. And I'm Donna Lawrence. Ow! Oof! Uh, so the Cover America Tour is a project of Consumer Reports Health magazine and uh, we've had thousands of people write to us with their stories about um, their problems with the health care system and we thought well let's go to them and, and hear them, let's hear these stories in their own words. So we're going across the country, we're physically going to people's houses, we're going to their living rooms, their communities, we want to hear what they have to say about their personal experiences with the health care system. Um, while we're going across the country of course we're, um, we're talking to 
reporters are talking to the media. We're talking, to, we're, you know, we're meeting with community groups. So, um, you know, we're just trying to uh, get as as many of these stories out there as we possibly can to be the faces of change um, for the reform effort. We want to, we're collecting these stories so that when the people that are going to be in charge in a few months from now um, in Washington are making these decisions about what needs to change, we can say, well, these are the problems. We've gone everywhere. We've gone every corner of the country. And this is what real Americans are dealing with. These are the problems you have to fix. And um, we launched from Yonkers, New York. Uh, which is the Consumer Reports headquarters, on uh, May 28th, and we're going to be going on the road until about middle of September. So we are committed to this tour for about four months. The project is, is really unique in that we're, we're trying to get a broad range of people and um, give um, kind of everyone a voice in, in this debate. So it's not, it's not just a problem of, of poor people or a problem of... Um, of just one group of society healthcare issues, it's it's really a problem of middle class Americans, a problem of upper middle class Americans, and the the problems are are wide, a wide range of issues, and that's really in just a week and a half we've really seen that you know problems with um I have health insurance but I I can't I, I can't seem to use it correctly as hard as I try or I I I've had health insurance but it looks like I'm gonna have to lose it because I can't afford it any longer or I have this illness that the doctors or the insurance companies can't won't, won't help me with or just a variety of different problems and as we we keep going I think we're gonna keep seeing a variety of different problems and how they really speak to the issues with healthcare in this country. Working with groups, um, we'll be working with groups all over the country and a lot of you know they have different agendas I mean some of them are state-based groups some of them are national some of them are universal health care um, some of them are just you know, have you know very different agendas so it's not it's not one group, kind of group in particular we're also talking with legislators and um, and local media along the way too. consumer reports with all kinds of consumer issues and consumer problems um, so health care really is just an extension of that and um, yes, yeah, several thousand people, and many, many more as this trip goes on and people hear more about it, um, are writing to us with their stories and saying, I've got a healthcare problem, come talk to me. You know, I can tell you a story about costs or not being able to get insurance or, you know, any number of things, the quality of the care that I received. Um, people are writing to us with all kinds of problems because it is a consumer issue. I mean, when it comes down to it, you're, you're buying a service and what are you getting for your money? Do you even know what you're paying for sometimes? Enormous blue RV. <laughs> we are not subtle. Um, you know, everywhere we go, people people read the side and they see Cover America tour and they see that it's a project of Consumer Reports Health. They see our website, and so you know the bus. I mean, it's it's a it's an end to the means, of course. I mean, we have to be able to get to these people's houses and and go talk to them and get to these communities. But you know, this is also this is our workspace. This is our home. This is our you know, we eat, live, and work and play in here. <laughs> it's everything rolled into one. We just thought it'd be the, it's, it's the really um, kind of building the picture of, of us. It's not just us flying into a city and flying out. It's just driving into a community and kind of going in and saying, okay, what's the problem? What are the problems people are dealing with here? And really just kind of immersing ourselves in it and not, not just an in and out, you know, real quick recent about the healthcare movement is that I, you can actually say now there's a healthcare movement. Um, I think it's it's only a sort of a recent thing that people say that healthcare is an issue. Um, environment there's environmental issues, you know, and there's there's all you know there's animal issues and there's all, there's all kinds of issues. But I think people haven't looked at healthcare as like this is an issue that needs to be solved. We need a healthcare movement in this country until fairly recently, um, and I think that we're adding to the movement. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're on board with a lot of these groups around the country. And, you know, we're all working towards the same thing, which is people being able to afford health care and get the health care they need without bankrupting themselves and their families. Mm -hmm. We're asking people to go to the website, CoverAmericaTour.org, and, and tell us their stories. And, and if you have a suggestion, if you live in, you know, Urbana, Illinois, <laughs> for instance, <laughs> for instance <laughs> and you have a great story, you know, go on and say, you know, come, come to Urbana and I'll, I'll tell you my story. You can come to my house or we'll meet you somewhere. And um, we'd love to just talk to as many people as we can. Because the broader swath of stories we get and get, uh, the better representation we'll have of the problems that are out there. And consumers have to speak for themselves. The pharmaceutical industry has their lobbyists, you know. The health, in health insurance industry certainly has their lobbyists. Even doctors and hospitals have lobbyists. Uh, but who's speaking for consumers? Consumers aren't going to, nobody's going to tell it better for consumers than the consumers themselves. And we think nothing tells it better than a personal story, not a statistic, not a fact sheet. 
um, nothing like coming something coming from the mouth of you know a mother or a, a you know a person that can't you know a senior that can't get the health insurance that they need for themselves or their families. Um, those are the people who we need to be hearing from. Those are the people that our leaders have to hear from. Mm -hmm. What we'll to do is go to coveramericatour.org and to check out the videos that we've done so far, hear the stories of, of real people around the country, share your story with us. Um, there's also some different actions you can take on there. So please go to the website, watch us as we go around the country, and, um, and kind of experience healthcare you know, at the grassroots level. So.